hello we are going to be discussing the grifters here shortly and we're just adding our Okay. I don't think there is. And when you first joined this one, you were unable to join yourself. So I don't know what we can do. I know there are rooms on TikTok that we can do, but not here per se. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well, well, I'll just give you uh, a little bit of yeah. for 20 minutes and then and Jenny will probably have a lot more to say. Yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about the elevator going. Yeah. Uh, um, it was definitely a very um, dark and depressing. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of hope throughout it. Um, I, I, I was looking a lot at it, well, from a lot of different perspectives, but one thing in terms of our four widows script is the role of women mm -hmm. this movie was very interesting because oh. women are I'm sorry. very powerful you froze up there for oh. a moment okay can you hear me now i can hear you your video is just freezing um every now and again Okay, so women's roles? Yeah. Um, so, I, for example, um, the two females are a lot stronger yeah. than the male. Mm -hmm. That being said, it, it also showed how in this world, which um, was, I, I'm, I'm thinking it came out in 92, but it looked kind of late 80s to me. In <laughs> A story that's based off of um it's a story that happened in the 50s oh, okay um well in this world in the world of the film um the women are still controlled by men very much so i mean and we saw some pretty dark things happening especially with um angelica houston's character yes. um where she failed to pay and what what happened to her. And then also even with Annette Benning's character and how she has to use, how she uses her body and yeah. ways to get, get through life. So um, it was kind of interesting to me to see the power that women have with their seductive skills in different mm -hmm. ways, but also when that doesn't work. Yeah. And, and uh, sort of, I guess the social commentary on is this, is this something that they chose, the characters mm -hmm. that they chose, or is this one of the only options that they had, given the I th it's It's interesting, so I have two things on that. One, I saw a podcast a clip today where um, someone goes, women are stronger than men. Like, no, men and women are both strong. We just learn to be strong, so learn to be strong. So I think that plays out in this movie as well, where it's like, how did they end up in these situations? And as a woman in any situation, we learn, we grow in this fact of, well, we know we can take it, we can get taken advantage of at any moment. So we have to figure out how to work around that. And part of that is using wilds and ways. And it was very interesting to me that it is part of their survival technique. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for both women in this film, including when it comes with her own son, she comes on to her own son as a way to distract him. And when it doesn't necessarily work, per se, that's when she hits him. And, and you know, we see her go to hell. So it's very um, interesting in that respect mm -hmm. um, on how how to grow and be strong and find control when there isn't control. Yeah. And um, the end of the film was really interesting too, because it seemed like it was 
then more of a question of um, what was more important, the power and what you're used to conditioning with having this money mm -hmm. or choosing the other path because she was really at a point where she could have walked away from it all. Had to yeah. start over. And um, there's another question there. Is that, is, is a life of, leading a life of grifting basically led you to not know how to survive any other way. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of predestined down that path. Or do you have that, do you always have that choice all along? Like mm -hmm. at the end of the film, do you think she could have decided to start over or was she too far in it that that wasn't even a possibility? She didn't know who she was without it. Yeah, I it definitely, because I think we see it on both perspectives with Lily and um, with his girlfriend, uh, because his girlfriend has just been looking for another partner to pull the same grift that she was used to pulling to have that amount of money again, to have all of that happen again, the thrill of it all. And when she can't convince him to do it, she thinks that if she, if his mom isn't a part of it, that's why she turns her in to the mob guy and goes after her. And I th think for both of them, it's just this want to be a part of it. And I think for him as well, because he went searching for it to become a grifter. Um, it's, there's like a romanticization about it of like, it's this life where you get to be free. You get to make as much money as you want or whatever. At, and yeah, there's bad parts in any relationship, like getting punched in the gut or burned by a cigarette or uh, your partner is insane, you know, all these things, but the money and the money is what draws people a lot of different ways. I do think that all of them could have left at any point, especially um, our male character, because he wasn't in a group organization. I think that the girlfriend could have been out of it for years at that point um, if she had just, you know, made that choice and decision. And I think the mom, I think that she also could have gotten out of it and probably just like done what he said, where it's like, go, go start. You can get out, you can get clean. Let me know where you're at and I can help you out in a couple months. Mm -hmm. You know, I think all of those opportunities were there. But I think what, and we see a lot of in other crime film and TV shows is, oh, I got this. I have this now. I want more because I can do more. And so I think that is, and it's not just in mob mentality. I think it goes into like esteem, like how you're viewed as a person. Like we have the issue with, with politicians and stuff of like, oh, I got this. Well, now that I have this title, maybe I can get that title, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that that drive is something that is within all of us. The question is, what is the thing that makes us want more? Right. So um, you said the word romanticizing it. And I think that that pretty much nails it for me is like in the film, the, the whole idea of leave, leading a life of a grifter is romanticized. Mm -hmm. um, to the way a lot of things are romanticized in like that in society and what the film shows us is that that's all an illusion you right know, with the price of this this darkness inside mm -hmm. and not willing to face that mm -hmm. then you really if you're not willing mm -hmm. to face all the things because you know you screw over a lot of people along the way um also this fascination like you said with power and money which goes beyond, like you said, the story of the film. I mean, that's something that is part of um, many societies, timeless in, in, in humans in general, of being fascinated with having this power and, and not being able to give that up. And the price that comes with that, like you said, at the end, she loses maybe the only thing that she had any con connection to in her heart, which was her son, because she was so focused on the money and the power to the point yeah. you don't realize it anymore. And in that respect, the film kind of speaks to everybody in question mm -hmm. how 
how much do we give into that in wanting things, materials, power, um, control over people? Mm -hmm. uh, Just control over our lives, I think, too. Because mm -hmm. there does seem to be, like, every film, story, whatever it is, um, no matter the medium, it is a representation of life, as I believe that's how Aristotle put it. And um, when you are constant, like, not everyone has the experience of being a gambler. Like, I had, I, I was like, wait, so what is she doing with the horses? How is she in trouble? I don't quite understand that. Oh, that I <laughs> Yeah. So I, I had to ask Spin, my cinematographer, how how that works. And he was like, this is what she's doing. And I was like, okay, I get it now. Okay, that makes sense. But it was something where I was like, okay. So we don't all know what's happening in every story because we can't all live that life. Mm -hmm. And we get to live that life through these stories. But there is something, there, there are these core things that we all experience and want and power and control are all things that, that we feel and can experience. And I think that's where this movie can be like, well, what would you have done? Where, where do you, which character do you see yourself as? Yeah. You know? One thing that was kind of interesting is they didn't give too much backstory on who these main characters were before we met them. There was a little bit there, mm -hmm. especially with Jack character. But nothing before the grift. We right. the one of them was, you know, when he was still fixated on becoming a grifter. Um, mm -hmm. We learn about, about Myra, the girlfriend, mm -hmm. who she was while she was grifting. Yeah. And then we don't know, know really the backstory of um, who. Um, Lily. Now the guy's name again. Roy. We don't know the backstory mm -hmm. who Roy had. Is mm -hmm. uh, you know the the real. I mean, if she had him when she was fourteen, I think they said mm -hmm. that's a whole story in itself. Like what happened there with Angelica Houston's character, and um, you know, so the the film purposely left out some of those things, so we only get to meet these people once they've already turned. Which I is I think that's also a way of saying there was no other life before the grift, especially in their minds. Grifting is all that they think that they know. There is no story before. There's only the grift. Mm. So, yeah, I think that, that story element. Yeah, and, and in that way, it's kind of interesting because as a viewer, not being a grifter, there's a little <laughs> attachment there. You know, because um, you think, oh, well, why, why do they keep making these choices? You have so much, you have money. Why do you keep putting it at risk of losing it? Or the scene at the end where she's just picking up the mm -hmm. cash covered in blood and she's mm -hmm. hysterical. She doesn't even see that there's more of it that she's missing. Yeah. It's just this need to constantly get it into the suitcase. Um, that's an interesting state of mind. I don't know. It's it's so extreme, you know. I I wonder, like, do you still feel connected to the character at that point, or are you? Because <laughs> it is such an extreme behavior. I'm just wondering, like, how did you take that? For me, when she got hysterical, I think this is more on of uh, the performance bit, or like, I don't know what she was told directing wise, mm -hmm. but. The way that she cries pulled me so far out of it because um, she's like heaving and like hi like hyperventilating is one thing and that makes sense, but like she's doing like a cat cow or cat cow like yoga thing as she cries where you see her back arch and stuff and like you had just seen her come on to her son, you just saw her you know like. I get, like, the one thing that made sense is, like, oh, my God, I just made this mistake. I didn't intend to do that. And then wow. when she starts, yeah, when she starts heaving and, like, all this whiny, I was, like, I'm so sorry. This is not, this is not for me. Like, this is, like, totally, like, this is laughable at this moment because that, 
just pulled me out of it because I think like the money part made sense, but the crying, it, it was like, that's just unrealistic crying. <laughs> well, that was my problem. It's, it's a place that, that, that um, I haven't been in, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, I, I, maybe it's hard, you know, it'd be interesting to talk to her to see what her process was to go through. Yeah. So, right. so hard to imagine um, going through that just as a, just as a person in general, but to, to be also in that mindset, because we kind of see how messed up she is by the end. Mm -hmm. She's pretty cool and collected until you see her like starting to come on to her son. And that's just like, so creepy. Um, well, no, before that, she is kind of hysterical. And then she realizes I'm going to have to grift my son and she comes back and she's cool and collected. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Jennifer is asking, do you find any parallels with any of the characters or tone of uh, this film, The Grifters, in the Four Widows script, the film that we are raising funds for now June 14th through Hourglass 24? Um, our campaign page will be up shortly, and you'll be able to find that link in our bio. But Danielle is the writer of the Four Widows script, and Jennifer is our producer. She'll be on here shortly, and that's why she's asking about the parallels between the characters or the tone of our Four Widows script, which does have a little bit of a, a mob bit in it. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's a really good question. So the, the genres are a little bit different, um, especially the, um, the grifters, you know, I think I read that it was based off of a pulp novel. Mm -hmm. So um, the genre of the, the pulp and the film noirs, a little bit different genre than um, our desert town, but they both deal with stories of people who are in the dark. Um, and there's two women, female characters in the grifters, and we have four female characters and four widows that are all coming from places that where society has molded them into a place that's very hard to come out of. And so I do see there being parallels there with, um, people in general being stuck in, in a hard place and being put there not by their own choice. Um, I do have to say that I was really, really impressed with the acting in The Grifters um, because those characters were pretty complex and the writing did not give too much away as to where all that was coming from. So I, I think the actors did a great job in trying that through their actions and emotions since the writing was kind of leaving a lot of it mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a lot of parallels in terms of there being real stories there. Like these, these are people that are in, are in a difficult spot. Um, and, and, and yeah, the dark tones. I mean, we definitely have some dark tones in Four Widows. There, um, I, I saw a lot of parallels with Myra's character. Um, to another character that we have in Four Widows named mm -hmm. Bunny. Um, and she, uh, she comes from, I, maybe not exactly the same place, but I would say those two could sit in a room and, and have lots of similar conversations. So um, it, was, it was kind of cool to see a film that was made 30, 35 years ago that had some characters in it that... Um, had similar backgrounds to characters mm -hmm. wrote, and yeah. maybe I was I was in the right ballpark doing the right thing. So yeah, that's a good question. I, I appreciate that. Well, that's fantastic. So I think we'll bring Jennifer on now and uh, talk with her about because she is kind of the film buff between all three of us. I think, uh, and this was her when I asked you know what films kind of inspire this. Um, this movie and what we want as a lookbook, she brought this one up and really any Scorsese film was what she said as well. So I'm definitely interested to see what she has to say um, here shortly. Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, uh, I will sign out then. Um, <laughs> stay, stay tuned to the live. Yeah. But we will, and, and have any questions that you have for Jennifer come through here that you can either ask questions in the comments or you can ask questions with a little question mark bubble and uh, we'll definitely answer them. And that goes to anybody.
Okay, great. Um, thank. You. I'm not sure how to sign out. Do you? You just tell me the, the, the okay. top. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. I was Danielle, our writer. Fabulous. And we are reviewing um, The Grifters, which is a film that is inspired by um, a, a film that inspires us when we are making The Four Widows, uh, which is a film that we are doing a campaign fund uh, for in June, June 14th. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Awesome. Thanks, Danielle, for chatting about the script and everything. Yeah. So, um, we so yeah, watched, we watched this today. Your idea. Sorry? Oh, you just watched the film today? I did, yes. Nice. So it's fresh in your mind. Yes. Really oh, really Stephen Jewell just joined. Um, Stephen's actually the person who recommended this movie to me. Okay. Uh, I probably saw it for the first time like a year ago. So it's not one I've seen over and over. I've just seen it a few times. Okay. Um, but it's but stuck with you. It really did. Uh, Especially when we were talking about this script and kind of the tone, I think one sequence especially that reminded me of Four Widows is the desert motel at the very, very end mm -hmm. um, that both of the women check into. And just yeah. kind of the aesthetic and the atmosphere of that place um, mm -hmm. really kind of reminded me of Four Widows. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of where I was thinking as far as it being a, a good movie to check out. Mm -hmm. I really like the um, ice bucket um, part where we see her go to the ice machine and we see this kind of spotlight on her. Yeah. Um, and it just was really cool. And then um, I enjoyed seeing the the role switch. I didn't when when they when he first went to check out. I was like, it's not going to be his mom. I was right. like, I know, I know. But um, I found it interesting that she dressed up with the girlfriend's clothing um at, to like get into the apartment and stuff. So. Right, right. Yeah. It's like the other interesting thing about this film, like you guys were talking about, I don't know who you're rooting for necessarily because it's all like who's conning who. Yeah. Um, even with Myra, you're like, is she long conning Roy? Mm -hmm. She talks about how she was like a long roper and who knows? Like yeah. um I mean I think he does know not to trust her, but uh it's just interesting at any time any of them could con each other. So there's just mm -hmm. no trust. Um also, so this isn't a Scorsese directed movie, but Scorsese did produce this. Uh um, yes. which is interesting. And it was nominated for a couple Oscars. Uh and Angelica Oscar. Houston, Annette Benning, and the director were all nominated. No no wins, but um it's kind of interesting because it's a little bit of a lesser known film, I would say. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like doing some research for it or just like trying to pull up the grifters, Google wanted to like gr do other different searches besides the, the grifters as a film. Right. So, like, right, even <laughs> the definition of it, right? Yeah. Uh, and I never knew before, I guess, uh, that that was like another name for a con artist, was it grifters yeah. or grifting? Really? So that's something I learned from this film, yeah. Um, See, I, I watched um, Leverage and Leverage Redemption. So, and in that show, they have, you know, different roles. And overall, it is a con. They are all con artists, but there is a specific role of the grifter. Um, and then another show that I watch is uh, uh, White Collar with uh, Matt Bomer playing Neil Caffrey. And uh, yeah. if you just want something, something good to watch, yeah. you just you watch that and you stare at this beautiful man and you're like, yeah. oh yes, That's I right. understand how, how anybody would fall in love with this man and do whatever this man says. Um, so- He has those big blue eyes, right? Yeah. Big blue eyes, beautiful smile. Uh, you just go, yeah, grifting, being a con artist, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. You can do this. Is that what so, White Collar is about? White Collar crime? Like so con? White Collar, uh, that TV show, um, Neil Caffrey is a white collar criminal, uh, steals paintings and, and does all these cons and stuff. So yes, White Collar crime. Uh, his FBI agent, Peter Burke, uh, does capture him. And later when they need help, catching uh, Mark Shepard, and that's how you know it's a good TV show. If Mark Shepard's a part of it, he was part of Firefly, Supernatural, this, I think he also, he, he shows up in a bunch of other fandom, oh, Doctor Who. When he oh, shows up, it's worthwhile to watch. Right. He just ends up in the good shows. Um, 
So to catch Mark, uh, Mark Shepard's character, the Dutchman, they basically have Neil Caffrey come out on loan uh, as a consultant of white collar crime. And that's, that's the premise of this. So, and, and he still gets to kind of play these cons and he's always, he's either conning uh, his friends around him or the FBI or like conning the other con artist for the FBI. Like he's always conning something. Um, so I think that kind of goes with the grifters. You never know who's conning who when you're, and it's hard to figure out who to root for exactly. because you don't, you're like, okay, well, I mean, in the end, I think you kind of are rooting for John's character um, because he is the one who doesn't have partners. He's the one who we first see get hit and hurt very badly. And when we see how the women react, they are just trying to use him to have some sense of security right. um, within their own grifts, whether yeah. it's the the um, broker grift or if it's like, hey, I got to get out of here. I need your money. I don't care that you're my son. I'm going <laughs> to insinuate that, that you want to have sex with me. Right. And so yeah. the survival instinct there. And then you're just like, all he wanted to do was do what his mom did, mm -hmm. which um, it's actually very, it's, there's a high statistic out there that, that um, uh, kids always end up in the same field as their parents, right. which makes sense. You see your parents do it. You understand the job. You go out and do it. It makes sense. So the fact that also his mom is like, no, you're, you're not tough enough for this is right. also a motivator for him as well. And so. that. That's like the one glimpse of her where I, I also feel that there might be a part of her that is saying that because she does care about him and wants him to get out. So she's like, if I say this, maybe it will push him. But it pushes him in the other direction of wanting to stay in and wanting it even more. But I agree. If there's anyone to root for, it's probably John Cusack's character because I think he's the one who has like the best chance of getting out of that lifestyle of any of the characters. Like yeah, um, my no way. I think Myra is addicted to oh, it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question from Danielle. Are there any scenes that stand out to you um, in the way that they are shot or in the acting performance? Oh, well, like, like I said, the, the, I think the scene that really pulled me in as like a reference for this is the whole motel sequence, even like the older actress who works at the motel and how they both arrived and they kind of look alike and she's like, wait, I just gave you a key. Mm -hmm. But there's like these similarities and that power struggle. And then not to spoil it, but there's a little bit of a twist mystery of like what just happened, you yeah. know, when John Cusack's character goes to identify whichever body it was at the very end. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I think that that whole piece and kind of the, the mystery with it and then the power struggle and like who's going to come out on top um and cinematically that whole motel sequence also kind of reminds me a little bit of a throwback to like alfred hitchcock's psycho okay. maybe it's like the car with the money in it parked in the back um yeah there's just something there that feels really cinematic and then other than that, I feel like there are some really good acting moments. I feel like Annette Benning is all over the place in a great way. You're just sort of like, she's just dangerous and unpredictable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So great performance from her. She also around this time did um, the movie Bugsy, which we talked about the other day, which is about Bugsy Siegel. So yeah, I love Annette Benning. Mm -hmm. I, when I was watching it, um, I don't know this actress's name, um, but probably what people would most know her from is she is, um, if you watch Marvelous Miss Maisel, she's, uh, Susan's sister, uh, oh. with the, I don't know her name. She also, she, she was also in Mindhunter as the social security officer. Okay. Um, and, and just, I think part of it's like the curly hair. And just like if you look at there's some people that have like period faces mm -hmm. I don't know but I've seen her act on the crazier side of things and I was yeah. like oh she I, if I was to cast this today yeah I would cast her. 
um, because that moment where it's like, oh yeah, we pretended that I got shot and like I, I made sure he saw the money and like, oh my God. Yeah. I was like, yeah, sh Annette Bennett's character, definitely. Um, for sure. One of, like, I very great that, that whole sequence is another thing that always sticks out because it's like, okay, they're conning and all this stuff, but the, the extent that they take their con to with like the squibs yeah. and like all the victims thinking that these people have been killed and everything. It's so next level. As and I think it comes God. to, um, cause when I'm watching this, I'm like remembering these shows, um, yeah. with like leverage and Neil Caffrey, um, in white collar, um, they do take an office like space in one of oh. these buildings. And I, I found it interesting. I was like, Oh, this one actually kind of explains how you can get into these buildings and have your name on the wall or whatever. And they just want people in there to have, you know, to, to fill up the space. They're half empty all the time. I was like, okay, that makes sense that they're like, okay, we'll uh, uh, take this building over here. We'll put our office in it and do that. And like, you see those extremes now in things like um, leverage and white collar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Myra just really breaks it down in that sequence where she's telling him all about it. Um, and it's funny to see John Cusack in a, in a role like this because, um, I don't know, it's just kind of a different kind of tone than I'm used to seeing yeah. him in. It's funny, too, that this director actually directed High Fidelity later, which is a completely different tone. And I love that movie, but it's very different. Have you seen High Fidelity? I have not seen it. Oh, yeah. You will learn this about me. I have not seen a lot of movies, so it's, it's based on a book. It's this guy, and it's kind of about I don't know. He's thinking about some of his ex girlfriends, and he works at this record shop. It's really great. So, it's John Cusack as well, um, but it's more the tone you usually think of John Cusack acting in. So yeah, yeah. Um, other scenes that stick out in this movie. Well, just Angelica Houston's performance in general. I don't know, there's something so silent and strong about her. Did you ever see her in the Addams Family movies? I didn't see her in the Addams Family movies, but um, did what, wasn't she Cruella DeVille? Oh, in I, live action, um, I original Hundred One Division? Possibly. Um, when she's when I saw her face, I definitely. Morticia Adams in the in the Adams Family movies from the 90s she just has like that strong kind of mm -hmm. a little bit scary um, element to her mm -hmm. uh, and I was also looking a little bit when I was researching this movie I guess his first choice for that character was Cher which is interesting that would have been oh. a unique and I, would have, I would have cast Cher as Morticia for sure yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. So both of these roles, and they were both actresses of around the same age at the same time. So, well, oh, you know what else I found Houston in that I loved and watched so many times when I was younger was um, Ever After, Drew Barrymore's Ever After, yeah. Uh, Cinderella. Yeah, she plays the stepmother. So she's just really good at that kind of scary, ill-intended type. Yeah. But then there's definitely. moments where I really feel for her in this movie, too where you're like, oh, okay, she's kind of skimming off the top. That's not very smart, but you kind of feel bad. And yeah. they kind of hint at in, in this culture that skimming off the top is also kind of expected. And if you're not, like she says, mm -hmm. if you're not, you're probably stealing more, right? Yeah. So, which then we find out she is. And she's not being very smart. But um, just how that's part of the culture, too. Like, oh, everybody's stealing a little bit from everybody. It's such a strange thing in these crime dramas, right? Yeah. Which I th think was very important when we see um, John's character have his mentor, that he's like, I want to learn how to grift. And he goes, you don't do partners. It's 50-50 split, right. but you don't do partners. And that seems to be the one thing that's, like, stuck with him through everything because at no point is he interested in uh, his girlfriend's grift. Right. Um, he's never him. like, I'm down for this. Yeah, he's like, no, thank you. <laughs> and he's not even down to help, help his own mother. Yeah. So, I mean, and there's still the distance of calling her Lily, not mom. Right. So, 
Mm -hmm. So it's so funny. We see he still has that kind of um, addiction to the adrenaline with the small time stuff where he'll he'll cheat a bartender or, um, you know, grab things for free. He's He's got that kind of adrenaline junkie addiction to that kind of conning. But I feel like he has no interest in these bigger, long game, um, larger organized crime situations. Right. But I don't know where that also ends for him either. You know, um, how does someone like that get out and find like a, a regular lifestyle? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Danielle was wondering, what do you think of the way women are portrayed in this film, especially considering that it was made over 30 years ago? Oh, well. I While you that, I'm going to look for a charger for my phone. Oh, yes, that's where it's at. Um, so for characters that take place in the 1950s, I would say they're unique in that they're these criminals who live on their own and are, I guess, in their mind, self-sufficient. Uh, so they're, they're, they're odd. They're not the typical female character we would see in the 1950s. And this movie was made in the 90s, I believe. Let's see, 19, yes, in the 90s. So you have the element of like these different types of characters in the 1950s being portrayed in the 1990s. I feel that they're portrayed what you would say, quote unquote, as like strong women, right? But at what cost? Um, really, they're not as independent as they believe because they they need these other people to steal from, to survive off of. So even though I think in their minds as characters, they're these strong women um, in their criminal lifestyles, they're really just as dependent on other people, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that answered the question, Danielle. <laughs> I think we, we touched on that too with... Um with Danielle when I was saying there was someone said you know um you know women a man said you know women are stronger and, and the woman replies no uh, men and women are both strong we just learned it mm -hmm. so we're not stronger we just learned how to be strong so learn to be strong yeah and I I think that is very clear in in this film as well when when something goes wrong, uh, women are problem solving and right. trying to survive. Right. Um, when they don't get what they need or think that they um, think that they need or want, yeah. they figure out a way to get it. Um, whether that is killing another woman yeah. uh, because maybe if she's out of the picture, things will work out better, or uh, you know seducing whoever you need to seduce mm -hmm. and whether or not it's within your morals right per se versus even the moment the where there's john character is like like he's punched in the gut and the first person that he he calls for like comfort is his girlfriend yeah and it's like no i don't want to go to a hospital it's like well like maybe you should like i get why yeah. Yeah. maybe you don't want to but it's like, hey, I got in a bar fight. Someone hit me pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So right. it's just kind of that process. Right. And and the, the interesting thing about these two female characters is uh, morally, like, everything's on the table for them. They're, they have no qualms about anything. So they're going to do whatever it takes to survive. And then there's the power struggle between them that culminates in the ending, where it's going to be only one can only one can survive out of these two characters because they have a lot of similarities in some ways, um, both of them. Uh, but I do think it's great that there's two strong female characters in the film and that they really are more of the focus than John Cusack's character. He's kind of experiencing them through his eyes, but they're the the main people that we're kind of focused on. Where we're serving the purpose of connecting the two stories together because otherwise we would not see because the the age difference that there is a grift no matter what and that kind of goes in with our film that we have several different age differences and showing older women as well uh, when you look at this uh he he mentions her going on 50 so i assume uh that she's closer to 30s um his mom yeah. 
uh, because he's supposed to be like 25. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they pick 40-ish, 40-ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Annette Benning's character so, is in her early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, which character do you identify with more? Um, Danielle is asking. Oh, oh, neither. Uh, I mean, probably Roy, John Cusack's character, where I, I find usually I'm more um, in these scenarios. I don't know. I don't know. Just because he's a male character, I, I still feel like I relate to him more where you're kind of in between these strange situations. But um, that's interesting because um, <laughs> with the lack of female representation through a lot of films besides Disney princesses, especially yeah. growing up, especially in these adventure stories like Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, uh, the reason why Hunger Games was so valuable um, was because we did finally see a female character take on an action role. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Jennifer Lawrence, for that. But it's very interesting that we see ourselves as those male characters, mm -hmm. although we are women. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you think that our film might help with identifying ourselves? Like we see someone who looks like us, who has our identity and be able to say, okay, I can do that too. Because right. it's not a man's, it's not only a man's world right. out there. So Right. And, and the cool thing I think about our film, so we have four female characters and there are power struggles and there is some crime drama. Uh, but I, I do believe that we kind of take it to a different solution um, mm -hmm. than the grifters. So finding like how we connect and how how we can work together rather than that power struggle becoming so um, physical survival minded against each other. Right. So that's what I'm excited about with our film is um, exploring these strong female characters without them having to, you know, destroy each other to mm -hmm. to exist. And yeah, I mean, there's that age difference there. And if you watch um, something like Ted Lasso, there is um, there is another female relationship where there's an age difference, but it's a very positive female relationship where we we see the older female um, who is Rebecca, that's her character name, um, aiding and 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 helping to um, lift up her um, friend Keely, who is younger, probably by about five or ten years, um, and just the difference there in that story versus here. I mean, obviously, it's a different world. Um, Ted Lasso is based off football, British yeah. football, so soccer, um, for the Americans out there. And uh, this is based off grifting. And so I think, you know, when you look, look at something that's made now with the female relationships versus then, I mean, even now, if you want to take a crime stance with it, we have something like Good Girls, which is a Netflix show um, that you can watch, mm -hmm. where it's a bunch of uh, middle class moms trying to make m make their rent and pay bills. And they think, oh, well, we could just hit up this store. The store is insured. And they end up stealing um, a, uh, a money laundering gang's money Ooh. from the store and now they're involved and they could get out there are moments where you're like you could have just left yeah. and once again we see that power show of oh i wanted more and we see a sister relationship and best friend relationship amongst these three women and it's you see the moments where they are the reason that they are doing this is because they're trying to help each other right they they're in this together but then there's also the moments where one of them who feels more like the leader is like, no, I don't care what your feelings are. I want this now. Um, right. And you guys, I need you guys to be a part of it because when we do something, when I do something, we do yeah. something kind of. Oh, and she kind of like takes it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If you have any sympathy for any of these characters. Sorry, what? For, for in the group. Yeah, and the grifters. Oh, I think all three of them because, um, I mean, there's a reason people become the way they are. Like Myra, you can think, is uh, 
you know, kind of just very destructive, but where in her life mm -hmm. did she find these survival skills, you know, at what mm -hmm. point? Um, and how did all of them become who they are now? And I do feel for Lily too. I think she does care for, for Roy, her son. And I think she truly does want him to find a normal life. I don't think she sees that for herself. But who knows, right. who knows where, where they all end up. That's what I will say about the end of that film. Who knows where they all end up? Um, and of course, Roy, I feel that he is just, just a little bit uh, set back just from his, you know, his upbringing and, and mm -hmm. the role models that he had. So in a way, I feel bad for all three of the characters. What about I you? Don't, do, do you have sympathy for any of them? I think the, the sympathy that I have is definitely for the mom when, yeah. when, when she comes in and she's panicked and she's looking for his money so that way she can leave. And then he tells her, you know, you you can not be a part of this anymore. Yeah. You can lean cleanly. And you just kind of see this moment where she's like, no, yeah. I can't. I don't know anything else. Yeah. So that's definitely. Yeah. Just that fear that she, that there's nothing else to her when she's a highly intelligent person who could have another life, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think that the ending ending is left for maybe some inter open interpretation to where everyone ends up as well. I don't know. Like, I don't know about Lumbra and, 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 and um, Roy, but when we see the elevator and we see the elevator going down, I think that is meant for us to be like, she is going to hell. Um, that is how I interpreted that, uh, especially because it's dark. She, you know, it's, you know, you know, head head as far away from from uh, this area as you can, kind of stuff. So, and um, Danielle was asking, what's the point of no return? And I'm like, I think when she, for her, when she killed um, Myra, Myra, that's her point of no return. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And it also, the thing is, like, it could have gone either way, right, with her and Myra, I feel like, in mm -hmm. um, at the motel. And, like, what would Myra have done if Myra had come out of that? She'd probably just run off the money, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> and I find it interesting it, because the mom's like, oh, she was after the money in the trunk of my car. And I was like, I don't know if, if she was after the money money or if she was after Roy right. um I think I think for her that's the question because having that power over him she never had that full power over him right because she, yeah I mean because he was like no no partners and um even that moment where she like she likes knowing that they want her yeah um like the moment that we see her first grift, you're like, well, what exactly is she grifting? Because right. she's not getting into diamonds. Right. And That's it's like, all, yeah, oh, no. yeah, yeah. That I think it is the emotion. And that's interesting because I think women characters can play into that more because I think we, we like, we play more with our, with emotions overall in day to day life. And being able to read people because that's part of how we survive is being able to know what what is happening around us. Right. And also, um, it is kind of this moment of like it. It's like oh, oh, cool. I didn't ask for this attention, but I have it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I might as well use it to the best of my ability right. and utilize it. And if I take control of that, then you no longer have the control. It's regaining something that feels like it's being okay. taken away. Right. And I, I think that Myra definitely uses that in her life. I mean, even the scene with her landlord, though, uh, it's like she thinks she's in control of it. But yet we see her kind of disassociating and, and um, mm -hmm. kind of splitting off when she's utilizing what she thinks is under control, but it's still affecting her. Right, like that scene affects me a lot. That whole scene with the with the landlord and her rent situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, Daniel was wondering which character um, would you have wanted to play? Oh, well, I guess it depends, like, on a few factors, like kind of where you fall on the age range at the time. But I think Angelica Houston's character, Lily, is the more interesting one that I would lean towards. Um, there's just a lot under the surface with her, and I love those kinds of characters. So that's what I lean towards. What about you, Danielle? Yeah. Yeah, Danielle, feel free to put in the comments answers to your own questions, because yeah. we were going to try and have all of us here on the play, but... What I about think... you, Jordan? If you were to play a character in this, which which character would do you think more interesting to play? Um, Myra. Myra. I, I think that, yeah, yeah, because... I think, I think because characters can sometimes be an extension of ourselves and, and Danielle's also like Myra too. I can see it. Um, I can see it. And it's, it is that way of being like, yeah, there's, there's definite moments in my life where it's like, where men have objectified me and stuff like that. And it's like, how do I get that back? Well, when in any bar situation, it's like, well, you want to buy me a drink because you think you're going to get somewhere, I'm going to make sure you buy the most expensive one. Mm -hmm. um, or like, and, and that is how I feel like I have control in that situation right. because um, then, then it's my choice what I'm drinking and, and getting that straight from the bartender because that, that's also very important for safety reasons right. as well. But I think, yeah. I think that Myra's bits still play a very large part in today's um, women and, and how we take control of ourselves and our bodies um, because it is our right to do what we want and there is this moment before we really see what she does with the jewel where it's where someone's talking about oh these women they just they don't know what to do so they just sell themselves mm -hmm. and I think that her, her character is the most relatable to today mm -hmm. so and she's just a lot of fun, too, as a character. She's really wild and free, and she plays with Roy a lot. Um, so there's, I, I can see how she would be a fun character to kind of dive into and explore, because there's, there's a lot of range, too, with her performance. Definitely. Definitely. So anyway, it is almost 6 o'clock. Um, any last regards into how this movie has inspired you for um, the Four Widows and how you want to see that shot and how you want to cast uh, anybody? Right. I think that the thing that's most inspiring is, um, you know, that there's multiple female characters who are the leads and that they're age diverse. That's a lot of the things that we have going on in our film. It's the four women highlighted and they're all different ages. There, there's a bit of an organized crime thriller element and we're in the 70s, the early 70s. Mm -hmm. So all of those things just kind of made this film um, seem kind of parallel a little bit. And also it's kind of like, uh, like how I was always saying, like in, in Goodfellas or Casino or something, some of the other Scorsese movies, the female character is kind of the side character, almost like Roy's character in this one. But this mm -hmm. is a different, situation where they're almost like Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci and John Cusack's almost more like who would be cast as like the regular female role or something like that. Um, so I think that's a really interesting aspect to the movie. I think it's also important that, that I was saying, you know, John Cusack's character is kind of the glue that lets us see both of these stories. Right. Because that's the relationship. But he is not truly demeaned in the same way that we see female characters done um as far as being this little tiny bit yeah uh female characters struggling with the conditions of their environment definitely um uh, yeah definitely so i think i think that when we think about equality in film and representation in film as we move forward in in evolving as filmmakers that we look at this film and and see how this character does play a part and how could we do that with other stories as far as who is the character that glues two different stories together that we would not normally see if we were only seeing one of their stories mm -hmm. or whatever it is rather than um it being like like the the bimbo character or right the stereotypes yeah, yeah the 
Mm-hmm. Stereotypes. Totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. So, Female characters struggling with the conditions of their environment and how they cope. Yes, it's very, mm-hmm. very much what um, the Four Widows script is is focused on. Yeah. And the Four Widows is uh, the film that we are producing, or that Jennifer is producing, and and Danielle wrote. Uh, and we are doing a campaign through Hourglass 24 on June 14th now. Um, our day got pushed back. Um, we will soon be uh, having a little pitch video that Jen and Danielle are working on um, okay. to be able to show to you guys. And we can't wait to present our Hourglass 24 link to everybody so that way you can follow that link and be able to help us out with funding for this film. Uh, we have the car. We have half the cast. Uh, we just need to be able to feed and uh, shelter our crew while we are out in the desert um, for a couple days. So um, if you'd like to help, either share or follow this account, and that would be a huge help for us right now. So awesome. any last remarks? No, this was great. Yeah, thanks for um, tuning in and everything. Yeah. All right, we'll see you, we'll see you uh, next week on Sunday uh, with another special guest. Alrighty, guys. You have a good one. Bye. Bye.